Now it's time for Toker Talk Radio, the voice of the marijuana nation. What are you people? On dope? Or you can tell. I am here. Uh, or you can talk. I experimented with marijuana and didn't inhale. Or you can talk and talk. Ten federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. While we talk about toke on Toker Talk Radio. So, by the way, when it comes to pot, you know, if you're 40 years old, you live in a log cabin in Oregon, you got 12 giant pot plants in your backyard, have a ball. Live from beautiful Portland, Oregon at Rolla J Studios. Yes, Plus your calls live at 971-533-7111. They're walking on their pants with their cap on backwards, listening to the end of a man, the Snoopy Snoopy poop dog. What's to keep somebody from getting all potted up on weed and then getting behind the wheel? Gateway theory doesn't work. It's a reality. Holland, is it real? Don't tease me. We're locking up people that take a couple of puffs of marijuana, and, and the, the next thing you know, they got 10 years. And now, here's your host, the guru of Gonta Graphics, the sultan of Sativa Statistics, and the worst nightmare of a reefer mad prohibitionist. A polite, perspicacious, productive pothead with a propensity for PowerPoint. Radical Russ Belleville. <laughs> Hey, you're right. <laughs> oh, that can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> What's this one with that? Is that Cubert? Uh, yeah, actually, I think it was. Yay! You're getting better at this. I was pretty good at Cubert, actually. That was one of the, that was one of the ones I could play. <laughs> <laughs> I liked Cubert. Welcome, everyone. It's Toker Talk Radio. Radical Russ hanging out here. We've got Brian the Red on that mic. Hello. And then we got Eden hanging out on that mic. Hello. Hi, Eden. How are you doing today? I am better now that I'm not so nervous. Second time I got here. <laughs> Nothing to be nervous about. We're just hanging out. I know about we're weed. all good here. That's what we do. We talk. We talk. Exactly. We sit. Yep. Yep. So uh, we're just hanging out here, and of course, I had some uh, technical difficulties in the first hour because you know Microsoft likes to release its patches on Tuesday, right? No, no. You you just have your setup to download and updates on Tuesday. That's the oh, default. That one yeah, it's different That's the days. Default. Whatever you. Oh, set up. it comes out any day, but yeah, and, I picked and, Tuesday. And, uh, I set mine to just download them once a month. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to take a look at the mothership. Yeah, we'll fix see. that. We'll definitely fix that. Let's make it do it on the weekend. That would be very nice. That would be better, <laughs> I think. Probably be good. Be much well, better. But you have to remember to restart the computer afterwards, though. Yeah, I have true. mine, so it usually restarts itself. Hey, well, if we've got it, if we got it happen at the end of the month, that'll be better. But anyway, just wanted to thank everyone for sticking with us through the uh, difficulties, and sorry that uh, we dropped the behind the headlines segment today. But uh, I will cover that behind the headlines segment in our next segment. We're going to talk about the Washington D.C. poll that just came out today, where there's majority support in Washington D.C. for legalizing marijuana. Now, that might not be surprising. You know, there's majority support for marijuana legalization in lots of places. What's surprising? is how much the support has increased in just four years and why th that has happened. There's a particular demographic group whose minds are changing on marijuana legalization in Washington, D.C. We'll tell you all about that in our second segment. Also, looking down the list of states in alphabetical order, Wyoming and West Virginia are probably down there among the ones you would think would be last to legalize anything. But we've got some stories coming out of Wyoming and West Virginia. We're going to get to in a later segment tonight uh, where we're showing you the progress that's being made all around the country. Also, we've got an update for you. If you're just joining us, the New Hampshire legislature has passed uh, a marijuana legalization bill 170 to 162. It now goes before a uh, commit, it goes before the House Ways and Means Committee, I believe, to determine the financial impact. And once they get the once they get the financial impact statement, it goes back before the House for a second vote. If it passes the House, it goes to the Senate. If it passes the Senate, it goes to the Governor. What chance does it have to get past the Senate and the Governor? We'll take a look at that a little later on in the show as well. Also, we have got a uh, more more information coming out of Denver and uh, the. The headline is plenty of buzz in Denver and not just for the Broncos. We'll take a look at how the East Coast media is covering West Coast legalization with this story <laughs> from the Boston Globe. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a good one. And then uh, Texas, we've got some photos and a story from our friends down at DFW Normal. This came up on the KERA.org. 
org website. That's a, a, a public station down there, I believe. And lots of information in there. Our good friend, uh, Sean McAllister, one of the Sean McAllisters, by the way, there's a S H A U N McAllister who's in Texas, who's a reformer. And there's an S E A N oh, McAllister God. in Denver, in Denver. who's okay. a reformer. There's two of them. <laughs> we, have, we have two Sean McAllisters. They're spelled different, but two Sean yeah. McAllisters. And uh, uh, so we'll talk. And, and what's nice about this is in the photo, that's the DFW normal photo that they're showing here on KERA. He's holding a bullhorn, and that's a bullhorn I've autographed. You can see my autograph on the bullhorn <laughs> in the photo from the time I was down there when we did our march on uh, Dealey, uh, Dealey Plaza. Oh, yeah. So we'll take a look at how marijuana legalization is progressing in Texas. We'll also have time to take your calls. You can see the number right there above Brian's head. It's 971 971- 533-7111. So we'll take a little break, and when we come back, we'll have more for you here on Toker Talk Radio on 420radio.org. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Cannabis Outreach Collective is an alternative health and wellness option located in Gladstone, Oregon that serves patients in the Portland area and beyond. We are a full-service alternative health and wellness collective accommodating patients with natural, organic, holistic, and homeopathic remedies, nutritional guidance, advice, education, and medical cannabis fully in accordance with Oregon OMMP law. You can find out more about Cannabis Outreach Collective on Facebook at COC503 or by emailing Cannabis Outreach Collective 503 at gmail.com or by telephone at 503 853 1319. Check out our menu on Weed Maps and visit Cannabis Outreach Collective today. 420 Radio, the activist radio station. When you are starting up a medical cannabis business, you don't just want any attorney. You want a fired up lawyer who understands the needs of cannabis consumers. The law office of Lauren Vasquez is your fired up lawyer for the cannabis industry. Lauren Vasquez knows the details of California marijuana law from both a personal and professional angle. Lauren Vasquez rose from the ranks of college normal activist to become one of the Bay Area's best marijuana lawyers. Visit her website, firedupmoyer.com, or call 1-855-MMJ-LAWS for more information. That's 855-665-5297 for Lauren Vasquez, your Fired Up Lawyer, or email firedupmoyer at gmail.com. The number again is 855-MMJ-LAWS, 855-665-5297 for your Fired Up Lawyer, Lauren Vasquez. Lauren Vasquez is an activist attorney you can trust. Call today. Welcome back, everyone. Music from Swank Sinatra. That's the name, Swank Sinatra. The song is called Silverback. You're listening to Toker Talk Radio, the voice of the marijuana nation. Our phone lines are open at 971-533-7111. If you got any questions, comments, suggestions, topics on marijuana and its users, we're here for you. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about... This uh, 
this shift in Washington, D.C. There's a poll that just came out that that shows 63 percent are in favor of legalization in Washington, D.C. Now, that's uh, greater than what we find in the national poll, the Gallup poll that said 58 percent support. So five points greater there in the new Washington Post poll. And when it comes to the people who are against legalization, and that's just one third of the people now, 34% in Washington, D.C., we come to those people that are against legalization, even they believe that marijuana shouldn't be punished by jail time. I want to give you a look at some uh, graphics that we have to display on this subject. Let's see if we can switch to a video screen. There we go. And... This is from the uh, Washington Post website. They got a couple of nice graphics on here, which is the Washington Post, Washington, D.C. poll, you know, polling residents of Washington, D.C. And the first question is, do you favor or oppose legalizing the possession of small amounts of marijuana for personal use? And we find in this poll that all voters, 63 percent are in favor of legalization. But there's a great gap when we look at this racially in Washington, D.C., and that's a very important demographic because as many people know, Washington, D.C. is the chocolate city, C.C. We're talking about a very large African-American majority, African-American population in Washington, D.C. Whites support marijuana legalization at 73%, but African-Americans are at 58%. But the big news is taking a look at the difference now between African-American support now versus African-American support just in January of 2010, when only a third, a little more than a third, 37% were in favor. So it's gone from 37% to 58% support in the span of four years, 21 point jump. And even the support amongst white people went up from 60% to 73%, a 13 point jump. And I have to say, this has to be attributable to the fact that marijuana has been legalized and now provides an actual case study of what legalization can be like and what it can look like. A lot of what uh, African-American voters and families are against when when they answer these polls and say they're against legalization, they're against the scourge of drug abuse. They're against the scourge of drugs in their neighborhood, of dealers on the corner. They're afraid that the gateway drug theory is real and that, you know, legalizing marijuana will make it okay and their their neighborhoods will become worse. But now, over the past four years, as African-American voters have been exposed to two factors, number one, being able to see the expansion of medical marijuana and now legalization in a couple of states and large cities in those states, and the sky hasn't fallen. And number two, the publishing of the new Jim Crow by uh, Michelle Alexander and the new renewed effort by the ACLU and NAACP and and groups that are are fighting for minority rights and and minority recognition. It's that these groups have realized, they've recognized that the war on marijuana is largely a war on them. That the war on marijuana is a tool by which we keep Jim Crow enfranchised in this country. You know, it used to be that you just they, there were separate water fountains and black folks couldn't be certain places and couldn't do certain things. You used to have poll taxes to try to keep black people from voting. Now, with the marijuana laws, it's quite easy to use the smell of marijuana or a, a drug dog alerting as an excuse to to profile and to stop and frisk young African American men. And once you can get them into the system, they're, there, they're then ineligible for federal aid or any sort of student aid or job training that might help them, you know, rise themselves up in life. And it becomes a vicious cycle where the only jobs that are available for them are jobs that have to do with the illegal market in the same drugs that got them there in the first place. And the fact that African-American audiences are starting to recognize that bodes extremely well for the passage of legalization, especially with with states and with, with major urban centers. And again, the other piece of information that's good to know from this poll is finding out that among those who oppose legalization, they said, all right, so you're against 
you're against legalizing the 34% that are against it. You're against it. But do you favor or oppose reducing punishments for small amounts of marijuana to a fine of 100 bucks or less? And what they found out is that the people that opposed legalization, the 34% that opposed legalization, almost half of them favored reducing the punishment. And it's kind of confusing because they put it all in a 100% graph here. But this section here are those that oppose, right? Your 34%. So there's 30, 33 that are not sure, right? So out of that, out of 34%, 16% favor reducing punishment. That's a, that's a little less than half of them. And more of them that favor reducing punishment than oppose it. There's a not sure there of 3% as well. So even the people that don't think we ought to legalize are split on the fact that it should be more decriminalized. And then, of course, 63% favor legalization overall. This tells us that in Washington, D.C., there's only about 14% of the people who still support prohibition, who still support some sort of incarceration for the mere possession of marijuana. And again, this bodes very well for the activists that are going to be working on this. There are plans for 2016 to put a legalization initiative on the ballot in Washington, D.C. Now, it's a tough road to hoe because everything that happens in Washington, D.C. is ultimately controlled by Congress. So the city council, they can make a law and pass it. Or the, uh, the people, they can put together an initiative and pass it. And then Congress can go, mm, nah. Congress can just disregard it. Congress can make it null and void. In fact, this has happened, folks, and it's amazing the lengths to which Congress will go to in trying to control Washington, D.C. Back in 1998, when Washington and Oregon and Alaska were becoming the second, third, and fourth states to pass medical marijuana, D.C. also had an initiative to pass medical marijuana. And so they held the election, and in first... The Congress, Bob Barr was the congressman at the time, attempted to prevent even the election from being held, saying that you couldn't even vote on this. And uh, the Supreme, you know, and they do it through funding, right? Because the House has the power for funding. So they say in the appropriations bill that comes up for Washington, D.C., you cannot spend any money on X, Y, or Z. And that would be the things you need to do to hold an election. This went to the courts. The courts said, no, you can't do that. You got to let the people vote. So it came through for a vote, and the people voted on it, but we don't know how they voted because then Representative Barr and representing the uh, prohibitionists in Congress passed another resolution that said, okay, well, now that the election's over, you can't spend any money to count the votes. That's right. In our nation's capital, <laughs> the seat of democracy, the leaders of the free world decided the people in their own city could have a vote, but we couldn't count it. It's just like a pretend, right? Just We're just having fun that day. And that went to court, and it finally was overturned and said, no, no, you have an election, you have to count the votes. So they counted the votes, and guess what? They found that 69% of Washington, D.C. residents passed the medical marijuana initiative, the greatest passage of any initiative that's been put forth to have medical marijuana anywhere in this country, had the most support in Washington, D.C. So what did Congress do then? Well, they passed appropriations bills that said, okay, well, you passed medical marijuana, but you can't actually implement it. Okay, 69% of the people want this, but you can't spend any money on having registries or cards or patients or dispensaries or anything. You can't spend any money. And this was the state of Washington, D.C.'s medical marijuana program throughout the rest of the 90s and throughout the 2000s until 2010 when the Obama administration and a new uh, uh, Congress there basically took their hands off and said, okay, you can go ahead and start to implement your program. How many people suffered in Washington, D.C. for over a decade when they could have been using safe, effective medical marijuana as passed by almost seven out of ten of their fellow residents? But no, it was all held up over politics, all held up over posturing. And the biggest irony, that Representative Bob Barr the one who subverted democracy and opposed sick people getting medical marijuana by vote, he went on to become a lobbyist for the Marijuana Policy Project trying to get medical marijuana passed. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? 
All right, folks. Well, it's 4.20 here in the Pacific Time Zone. Time for us to take a break. When we come back, we'll take some of your calls. Also, special announcement, Gordon Green's Music Planet will be on tonight at 8 p.m., taking the Red Eyes spot. So check it out. we got Brazilian music tonight at 8 p.m. Pacific. Have you ever met that funny repo man? Repo man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that repo man. Hey, Tokers and Tokets, Radical Russ here to introduce you to my friend Matt and all the staff at Lush LED Lighting. Growing plants indoors can be a rewarding hobby, but electricity bills can go through the roof. Then you have to cool down all those big hot lights. It can drive a grower insane. With Lush LED Lighting, you can solve many of these issues and double your rewards. If you thought LEDs were meet the tech of today, Matt and his scientists have developed the perfect light for flowering plants with far less cost and heat. And the results? Let's just say I appear at a lot of events with the masters of indoor horticulture, and the harvests I saw from Lush LED Lighting were big, tight, sticky, and very effective. Check out LushLEDLighting.com right now and tell them Radical Russ sent you. Double your rewards and lower your expenses with Lush LED Lighting. No herb thrasher from the herb thrasher flower hour now get ready for herb age designs for the proud cannabis consumer herb age designs lifestyle gear for the 420 friendly herb age designs home of the famous lighter leash herb age designs get your herb age t-shirts and hoodies and show your pride herb age designs we've got frisbee golf discs and durable hemp gear Herb Age Designs. We've got shot glasses, drinking glasses, coffee mugs, and beer cozies. Check us out on Facebook and online at HerbAgeDesigns.com. And follow Herb Age and Herb Thrasher on Twitter. We'll see you at this year's Hemp Fest. Crank it up. Getting High with Adam, with Adam Ill from Los Angeles, California. Every Friday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern and 8 p.m. GMT, right here on 420radio.org. We can't hear to get too high. 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 Roll it, roll it, roll it, light it. Ah, there we go. A little Cypress Hill times Rusco. A little dubstep remix there of Roll It, Light It. Welcome back. It's Toker Talk Radio. Again, our program note, uh, Red Eyes Reggae Flashback is off tonight at 8 o'clock. You'll get to hear... Gordon Green's Music Planet. There's a great Brazilian music episode that he's playing tonight. It's supposed to be on 11 a.m. today. We had a glitch in the system, but we'll run it tonight at 8 o'clock. So check that out. All right, moving down the uh, list of states. Of course, we talked about how the states in the W's. We got Washington. We still have West Virginia, Wyoming, and Wisconsin to work on. And today we get news from two of the three of those states where West Virginia has now got a bill poised for legalization of medical marijuana. It might be introduced this session. We'll talk about that. But first, let's go to our phone lines where we've got the 802 area code on the line. 802, what's on your mind? Hey, Russ, it's uh, Matty here in Vermont. Howdy, howdy. I somebody... Somebody should at least call in from the East Coast to celebrate with New Hampshire tonight. Yeah, that was great. 170 to 162, making it the first uh, legislative body, House or Senate, uh, in the country that has voted to legalize marijuana. And we in Vermont are embarrassed. I mean, we're seriously embarrassed here. (laughs) Is there like a like a a state to state rivalry, New Hampshire and Vermont that way? Well, what I just want to point out is that this is so amazing that New Hampshire would do this. It's just out of character. Really? 
Oh yeah, I mean, well, I, I mean, I thought Vermont for sure would embrace this much before the more conservative state of New Hampshire, where if you have a Jerry Garcia sticker or a Grateful Dead sticker, you're going to get pulled over. Hmm. And you know, New Hampshire, of all of those New England states, was one of the last ones to embrace medical marijuana, too. It's going to be wonderful because I'll be able to drive to Maine and the coast without getting arrested. That's very, very nice. And uh, any uh, prospect on getting it past the governor there in New Hampshire? I know that getting Maggie, uh, I think what's her name, Maggie Hassan? Uh, yes. Getting her to sign medical marijuana, she wouldn't even do that unless they took out home grow. So what's she going to do with legalization? Uh, it seems that she obviously has some pressure holding her back. I think her intentions are good, but her actions are limited at this time. Uh, and uh, uh, it's just amazing, though, that the, the people of New Hampshire are putting it out there. And I think if there's more pressure from citizens in New Hampshire, <clears throat> everybody out there, uh, we might get uh, some bending there. Yeah, I, I think so, and and I also think <clears throat> I also think there's a there's an aspect of geographic economic pressure that goes on. Uh, I was just having this chat on our in our chat room with Aftershock Phil, who's in Washington State, and you know lamenting how the rollout of legalization in Washington State is is proving pretty perilous to to the uh, medical system that, that it has been working there. The um, and then I keep saying that. This is the growing pains of legalization, because once Oregon and California pass a legalization, Washington has to keep up with whatever they do. Once New Hampshire passes a legalization, Vermont's got to keep up with what they do. So as, as these places change, I think they'll start to affect one another. I, it's got to be so. It's got to be so. And it, again, this is for the people around the country that don't know New Hampshire, this is amazing. Yeah, it, it is really, uh, really amazing. And, uh, you know, I've followed it as best I can from out here. I remember when uh, maybe it was the 2008 election when the uh, uh, Granite State, uh, what were they called? Um, Granite Staters for Medical Marijuana, something I think might have been their name, were going around because New Hampshire is one of the, the first uh, primary states. And so all the politicians who are running for president have to go there and have to make public appearances. And they were hounding them all over the state with medical patients. You know, uh, you know, I have Crohn's. Would you put me in prison? You know, <laughs> and it just would make for the best, most, uh, you know, cringeworthy from the politician's point of view, you know, because there'd, there'd be ones where like John McCain would turn his back on a patient or Mitt Romney would walk away from one. I mean, it was just amazing what they're doing in New Hampshire. And I think I think a lot of that, you know. We have to thank guys like Matt Simon and, and the folks up there with Marijuana Policy Project and some of the other activist groups in New Hampshire that have uh, made this push. Actually, absolutely. We'll, we'll thank everyone that's helped all the way along. And, of course, the science is there. The science is what we're basing everything on, and that will carry us through. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we've got Sharon in our chat room right now, Georgia Mom for Marijuana. And, uh, you know, I always kind of she's kind of a, my touchstone to the south and the conservative attitudes there and she just had something wonderful in the chat lady who says can anyone say wedge issue and you know if we look back in politics you look back to 2006 and the gop and carl rove uh conspired to put a whole bunch of anti-gay marriage issues on the ballot in that's like 20 states or something it was a lot of states and uh it was the wedge issue right we're gonna we're gonna bring out the conservative voters by having marijuana or having having the uh, gay marriage issue here uh, that'll bring out the conservative religious voters and that'll help, you know, the GOP president. Well, now we face the prospect of marijuana being the wedge issue, that marijuana becomes the thing that brings out the younger, more liberal progressive voters. And that's even being touted right now in Florida, where uh, 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 John Morgan is is pushing for medical marijuana. He's the high priced, high profile, rich attorney out there in Orlando. He's also the boss of Charlie Crist, the former Republican turned Democrat who's running for governor in Florida. And they're saying that the medical marijuana issue may bring out more Democratic voters to help Crist get elected. Uh, I recently saw a video that was forwarded to me by uh, Keith Strop, and it showed people uh, testi testifying in Virginia, and they were middle class and upper upper middle class people. And they were coming out telling they were smoking, too. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing the changes that are happening. And uh, we're glad we could all be a part of this here at 420 Radio. We have another caller on the line. We can join in. We've got 541 area code. That's Oregon. What you doing? Hey, Russ. It's uh, Canada Justice. How are you doing? Hey, Justice. Um, I, was, um, I, I was thinking that, I mean, the thing to do, because you know how the tea, these tea freaks really got elected, was 
they had people run to be precinct committee people, which in a demo- and, and how that works is they're the people who actually of, of the party who actually choose the candidates that run. So the people who chose the candidates that ran, are, so they they just chose really freakishly right wing people, mm-hmm. and and that's how that happened. And it's totally possible for us to do that as well. I'll be looking um, into that in the near future as well. But that's really how they did it. So if we can get people, you know, who have that opinion already to run, then we won't have to, like, parade people out. And we won't have to say, please, please give us this. You know, that's, we'll just put people in there who already agree with us. That's a that's a really good idea, and it's something that, um, you know, you, there's people that advocate, you know, working within a party to mold that party. And the tea party is a really good example of how, uh, now we can, we can debate about how grassroots they are. I mean, they got a lot of funding from the Koch brothers, but that's a whole political rant we don't need to get into, (laughs) but I mean, you can at a grassroots level affect these things by doing the little minutia in politics. A lot of people don't think of like being a precinct committee person, right? If we did that within the Democratic Party and upheld a standard that you can't get on a Democratic primary ballot unless you are a progressive on the issue of marijuana legalization, you're right. We could have that kind of effect. Yeah, but and there are certain things we can do with other parties that we agree with. You know, like we agree with, the, I, I mean, I agree with the Green Party quite often on a lot of things. And why can't we form a coalition of people, even with the libertarian people, um, who don't necessarily agree with um, the way that, See, I, I mean, I'm a democratic socialist. Like, I, if I had my way, we'd, it'd be more like Sweden or something like that. But we, it's not how it is. But we, what we can do is form coalitions and agree to make, if there's a candidate that, that is for, like, a certain position on an issue that is this big, why can't we all get together and support that candidate rather than having to, like, be so chained to a, a, a party or a particular yeah. You know, I think that's happening in some respects where you see a bill, you know, like some of these uh, these banking bills and some of the legalization bills and the states rights, leave them alone bills that are up in the federal Congress. And then you get yeah. guys like Earl B- Blumenauer, who couldn't be more lefty. Well, I guess Bernie Sanders is probably more lefty, but, you know, Earl Blumenauer. Both sides awesome. <laughs> yeah. Earl Blumenauer, my representative, is pretty left wing uh, alongside Dana Rohrbacher from California, who's pretty right wing. So it happens. I mean, marijuana is one of the political issues that it's kind of what I, I would say it's the fringe political issue, no matter which party you're in. Right. It's not a centrist yeah. issue. It's the it's the left wing progressive issue or it's the right wing libertarian issue. Right. Well, also, it could be it's the it can be the conservative issue. Also, and my father in law is extremely conservative. Um, you know, he just po- now he's posting things that, you know, saying on Facebook that said, you know, I'm, what, I mean, I'm marijuana legalization is cool and all, but I'm more about him and. I was like, cool, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But there's, those are the people who um, who can maybe, the hemp thing, they can accept that with it. And that kind of leads them all um, to, uh, I don't know, to agreeing with us a little bit. No, on I get you. It's, it's a crack in the ignorance. And that's, that's yeah. one of the things I always say is like, uh, don't try to get, you know, an opponent to swallow the whole legalization thing whole in the in the first talk right mm-hmm. find out where they have a little agreement and like you say okay well we can disagree on people smoking pot to get high but come on we really shouldn't be banning hemp should we yeah, get, yeah. getting people to 180 on something is pretty tough you know <laughs> totally. so it was all just about education and meeting people and it's almost it's it's been a coming out you know like i had it's like i had to come out to a bunch of people mm-hmm. and it's it, tough. I remember, you know, <laughs> my first my first few uh, years, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, when I was doing this work, I'd come back to Idaho and hang out with my family or be at a, you know, picnic or a Thanksgiving or something and talk about doing marijuana advocacy. And they'd, and you see that look on their face. and I would immediately jump to, well, you know, I'm helping medical marijuana patients, <laughs> right? Like I had to defend what I was doing right now. I don't now. It's like, no, I'm completely for legalization. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard. It's hard to get there, though. Hey, uh, we've got another phone call here. Our, I believe it's Electric Bob on the line, probably uh, telling us about tonight at 10 o'clock. Bob, is that you there? Yeah, that's me. It's me. Uh, uh, yeah, 10 o'clock. And actually, I, uh, you played uh, Rusko earlier, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to. He's in my. Uh, I have a song of his in my mix. 
Oh, excellent, excellent. So you get yeah. uh, 45 minutes yeah, of, of great electronic dance music tonight at 10 p.m. Pacific. At 8 p.m. Pacific, Gordon Green's Music Planet. So that's cool. Yeah, and uh, I actually wanted to touch on what he was saying. Like, I don't, I don't see how uh, many states can, can have it stay illegal when there's, I'm pretty sure by 2016, Arizona, the whole West Coast is going to be legal, and some of the East Coast is going to be legal. It's going to spread like a virus. It is. It is going to be hard, uh, harder, much harder for these states to maintain prohibition outright. I think. I think they'll have to relax a little bit. I, but I think there's going to be some places like Oklahoma, Kansas, that are going to be dry for quite a while. Yeah. Well, there's still some. There's still some places in Texas where you can't buy alcohol. There's dry counties everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And and slowly, what has to happen is as Colorado and Oregon and Washington, and California, and all these other states that that have legalization uh need to just make sure that it run that it continues to run smoothly that tax revenues actually do come in and, you know when the, as soon as these other states see the benefits of it it's going to take some time maybe some of the older generation of politicians to die off but they will come around yeah and i actually have a new story here from arizona there was a uh a recent bust of a 600 uh, 600 plant go up between two facilities and the, the cops had boasted about it on Facebook and the guy's like 56 and people it's just ridiculous how they can still keep it like arresting people over plants yeah yeah and Arizona is right. uh, one of the two I would consider the two worst states for marijuana is Arizona and Florida yep. uh, in both Arizona and Florida you can get a felony for first time possession of an ounce of weed in Arizona, oh, yeah, it's, known... it's any amount. If you're not medical in Arizona, you're caught with weed. Any amount can be felony charges. Yeah, I've known people who have went to went to Tent City all over a quarter. Yeah, no. exactly. It's a tough place to be a, a, a cannabis consumer. They got anti paraphernalia laws. They got a per se zero tolerance DUID with a twenty. I think it's twenty four hour mandatory uh, jail time when you're uh, when you fail now, the test. Now sometimes they're keeping them there, you in there for a week, up to two weeks. Mm. Mm. they're getting harder on it now I, I don't know if it's just drunk driving or if it's the UID too yeah. but I know yeah, it's, it's mandatory either 24 or 48 hours in, in downtown jail yeah yeah and you know you know what they say uh, in Kevin Sabet and Project Sam nobody really goes to jail for marijuana possession of course not <laughs> no, no. And, and I know a lot of people that have went to jail just for possession here yeah well, of, it's, it's sad to hear made, all right, well, we'll look forward to the uh, 10 p.m. Uh, premiere of the latest episode of The Electric Bob's Bugaloo. Thanks for calling in, Bob. Cool. I'll talk to you later. All right, we got another call on the line from the 706 area code. 706, you're on the air with Toker Talk Radio. What's up, Russ from Georgia? Hey, it's hey, Sharon. Sharon. How are you? Our Georgia mom for marijuana. I am high. How are you? <laughs> so am I. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, yeah, I was just calling in to give you all an update. I've been thinking about uh, calling in and, and just telling you guys what's going on, and I thought, well, hey, I'll take the opportunity to just let everybody know. That's what we're here for. Well, um, I signed up first and foremost for my lobbyist pass today, so I am now officially in the, a lobbyist for Peachtree Normal in Georgia. Yay. Um, we went uh, Sunday night um, with a all-star team of 12 activists and uh, uh, went to the um, Wild Hog Supper that they hold, the 52nd annual that they hold for the legislators. And we got to speak with Nathan Deal, our governor, um, with Casey Cagle, our lieutenant governor, with David Ralston, our speaker of the House. We are seeing nothing but open arms. And it is incredible. We have a huge announcement um, that we will be um, releasing at a press release. So watch for Georgia to be making the news on Monday and Tuesday of next week. Well, um, so we've got we've got polls in hand, and uh, we're going to be releasing those numbers and start uh, lobbying. But last night we got uh, news that the. Um, legislators are going to uh, not only talk about this, uh, they are going to bring it up and to a vote 
in Georgia, and they are at this point talking about medical. Um, of course, you know, as a normal advocate, um, I'm for any type of uh, progress, um, but we uh, are pushing for decrim, going straight from decrim to legalization. That's great. Uh, we don't really believe that um, patients are going to be able to get medicine as quickly in Georgia as they expect um, if we go medical, uh, and that's something that they may not understand, but we have the facts to prove it. And so that's kind of our plan is to go in and say, these patients want medicine now. We can't do like other states because we're behind the ball and we're behind everybody. And these patients are going to be upset with you if you put a Band-Aid on it and it takes two years to get medicines in their hands. Right. And, uh, and you can, so the you can... only way to go in Georgia would be decrim and bring it out of the, you know, underground, really, honestly. And, and 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 keep these people that we have that have been growing marijuana in Georgia since Prohibition started and bring them out, and we could have medicine tested and in the hands of these people within a month, probably. And that's the message I'm taking to the legislators. That is, that is great news. And uh, when you uh, got your polling there, uh, what did you get with respect to legalization versus medical? Um, I am not... At privy oh, can't to tell say that. yet. Oh, um, my goodness. <laughs> right. We we had the whole campaign planned out. And y'all are getting us, you're kind of getting a scoop that we even have the poll in hand. Um, but the numbers are positive. I think they will be shocked. And um, we will be releasing that, as I said, at a press release with all of our coalition that we've built with other people that are working on things such as mandatory minimums and ban the box and harm reduction in general across the board will be um, releasing those polls on uh, Tuesday at the and, and delivering them to our um, governor. All right. Well, we'll stay tuned for that on Tuesday. Uh, also want to know what's the progress on your forthcoming event at the King Center in March? Uh, yeah, we are uh, in the process of securing speakers, which I need to talk to you about. Please rest uh, at your earliest convenience. <laughs> um, LEAP is sending down speakers. Uh, they're going to be sending down um, Neil Franklin. Uh, and we are doing the Lee, uh, the um, thing at the King Center will be on Friday the 28th of March. And then the Southern Cannabis Reform Conference will be a one-day event this year because we're, we're joining in with our coalition with the NAACP and LEAP and um, the ACLU on the thing with the King Center as well. So our event is going to be just one day, and it will be on Saturday the 29th. Excellent. All right. So I'm uh, going to the calendar right now. The 28th and the 29th are marked out for Peachtree Normal. I'll be there. We'll just have to work out the details. Oops, oops, Hello? oops, hold on. Sorry about that. I had the mic turned off on your side. I was just saying I was getting into my calendar and uh, marking off March 28th and 29th. They are set for Peachtree Normal. We just got to work out the how and the where. So thank you so much, Sharon, for uh, giving us a call there and letting us know. We're going to take a break. And uh, when we come back, we'll have more discussion. We're going to take a look at Wyoming and West Virginia, what their chances are as we continue the ball rolling across the United States. Stick around. You're listening to Toker Talk Radio on 420radio.org. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belvin Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Cast your eyes up to the skies. What is it to live and die? Calculate I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. 
Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. Four Twenty Radio, the home of marijuana experts. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 1920s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. Well, I was sitting in my living room, sparking up a bowl. You won't believe what happened next. Well, the cops kicked down my door with the guns waving in the air. I thought I'd best say a little prayer. And I knew something just wasn't right when he pulled me from my chair. He said it was a drug bust. I had the feeling it was unjust. I said, I think you got the wrong fella, guys. I only smoke the stuff. He threw me down on the ground. So I asked him for a reach around. I may as well get jerked off, because it looks like I'm getting fucked. <laughs> Took my Welcome back, everybody. That's Chief Greenbud with the drug bust. You can catch Chief Greenbud at chiefgreenbud.com. Get his albums, number one, number two, and number three, chock full of great country parody marijuana music. And he's a good guy, and his weed is excellent. He's got some really good weed. Well, you would think he's a chief. That's right. He's growing it in marijuana, Tennessee. That's right. All right, we're hanging out. I'm Radical Russ. This is Brian the Red, and we've got Eden sitting in today. How you doing, Eden? Chilling out. Just mm-hmm. you know, up in my THC content. <laughs> up in your THC content? Yeah. Well, we better up ours. Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, let's take a look now at a couple W states, uh, West Virginia and Wyoming. We've been talking about these today because there's been – there is uh, – the lawmakers in West Virginia m- may be introducing a bill – to legalize medical marijuana in West Virginia. And this is uh, State Delegate John Ellum, a delegate's like a senator, or or actually more like a a congressman, right, representative. But State Delegate John Ellum, who's a Republican, said it wouldn't be the first time a bill has been introduced, but he said the past ones have been too broad. Ellum told the, uh, let's see, the West Virginia News and Sentinel, uh, told them, quote, I would want it more limited to the few conditions medical marijuana is valid for, end quote. There's always the problem every time you introduce a new medical marijuana bill is they want to restrict it more and more. They want to have fewer and fewer conditions eligible because they're trying to keep the potheads out. They want people (laughs) abusing the system, right? And all that does is hurt sick people, (laughs) you know? So suppose you are a guy who's, you know, got chronic pain, but not super duper chronic pain. You know, are you going to be left out? Well, you're. I'm sorry. I know you're in pain, but you're not in nearly enough pain. You only complain four out of seven days. <laughs> yeah, right? you know, really. Define you got to complain enough. six. Yeah, you're not seven out of seven. You're not days. in enough pain. We we can't. No. Uh, so that always bugs me. But of course, you know, we support you know moving laws forward, and this would be great for you know West Virginians with cancer and AIDS and glaucoma and a bunch of other things. But I always just cringe when there's like, oh, we've got to make sure it's a restricted list of conditions. Mm-hmm. You're lawmakers. Yeah. How about we let doctors decide yeah. what that would conditions? Be better. There's yeah. an idea. And, and then there's going to be, of course, no homegrown, most likely. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, let me. Re- 
it doesn't say anything because they haven't actually introduced one yet, but mm -hmm. I, I would imagine that yeah. that would be likely. Well, you know, that's the trend lately. You know, it's like, what is it, eight now? Eight states or nine? Uh, nine now. Nine. New York. Uh, scary. Out, right? New York, yeah. The no home say, Oh, yeah, you can have your weed, but it has to come from the weed fairy. Yeah. There's a state senator, Donna Boley, who's another Republican, who uh, expressed unwavering opposition to the idea of legalizing medical marijuana, saying, quote, we already have enough problems with prescription drugs. We would be opening the door for more problems. Oh, please. Well, okay. So first of all, why isn't that an argument to make the prescription drugs illegal? <laughs> and second of all, do you realize that marijuana is superior to prescription drugs in a lot of uh, instances and has far fewer side effects? I came off prescription drugs just to be on weed and... I'm a much better and more productive person. Thank you very much. Well, there you go. And far far less deadly side effects, for sure. I almost died from overdosing on painkillers. Really? Yeah. So, yeah. And since using cannabis, you... No, I never overdosed. The worst thing that's ever happened is I fell asleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, yeah. Like yesterday, I was supposed to come, and I fell asleep and didn't schedule a ride. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were glad you got the ride this time. Yeah, right? <laughs> But yeah, that's so frustrating when I when I hear these things. You know, we already have enough problems with. We already have enough problems. It's like I made an analogy the other day. Uh, you know, it's like we already have enough problems with concussions in football. So let's ban golfing. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, that's the same logic, right? It's like uh, prescription drugs, by the way, are toxic and addictive. That's probably why we have most of the problems with them. Oxy's very addictive. I've been on oxy and. My doctor cut me off when I came here. I, w I was thought I wanted to do both at first, and he cut me off. And if it hadn't been for the wonderful guy who kept me very well medicated for the first couple of months, I don't know if I would have made it. And But you know what? I When I went and seen my doctor the next time for something else, it was my GP, I thanked him. Yeah. I said, you know what? You just did me a really big favor. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And this is the thing that people don't understand about the abuse of painkillers is not just limited to these heavy-duty ones like OxyContin, Dilaudid, Percocet, etc. There's a story on CNN right now, CNN Health, from the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. Acetaminophen doses over 325 milligrams might lead to liver damage. They do lead to oh. liver damage, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's what they say. If you're in pain after surgery and your doctor prescribes you Vicodin or per Percocet, but when you get home, the pain hasn't subsided, you decide to pop some extra strength Tylenol. Unknowingly, you may have just taken more of the drug acetaminophen that is safe. Acetaminophen is often used in oxy, Vicodin, codeine. Right. And then when you take a Tylenol on top of that, you're increasing your dosage of acetaminophen beyond the 325 milligrams. Yeah, I was on so many painkillers, they had to give me ones without the acetaminophen. Because mm -hmm. I was on like six a day. Well, in 2011, the FDA asked manufacturers to limit the amount of acetaminophen in prescription combination drugs to 325 milligrams per capsule. So when you're getting your Vikes or your Oxys now, they're limited to 325 milligrams of acetaminophen. But then you go and take more acetaminophen, Tylenol or whatever, and you're setting yourself up for overdose. According to the National Institutes of Health, quote, acetaminophen overdose is one of the most common poisonings worldwide. Wow. They've limited the maximum recommended dose for adults at 4,000 milligrams per day, but it's easier to reach this limit than you might think. One gel tab of extra strength Tylenol contains 500 milligrams. So eight of those gel tabs and you've hit your max for I the day. I thought it was 2,800. Did they raised it to 4,000? 4,000 total. Yeah, yeah. The, I believe the limit used to be smaller oh, as yeah, far as how much you were I was a medical transcriptionist in 2,800. I don't doubt that at all. I I would agree with you. And, you know, and I think they raise these limits and I have no proof of this, but my theory would be, or my hypothesis would be they raise these limits upon pressure from the drug manufacturers. Well, my doctor sure didn't like it. You know, if you got 2,800 as a limit and you got 500 in a pill, you're saying you can only take five of my pills a day before you overdose. <laughs> Could you bump that up FDA a little bit so folks could uh, buy more of our product? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can see that happening. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's what's going on as far as, uh, you know, in the, in the West Virginia with their medical marijuana. But I wanted to get you some poll numbers. When we come back, I'm going to give you a poll numbers on the public support for medical marijuana, decriminalization, uh, and other legalization options in West Virginia. And we'll also close out by taking a look at Wyoming. So stick around. Just a few minutes left here on Toker Talk Radio. It's in 
simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us go. It's simply business. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business, you know why they won't let us go. It's simply business. It's simply business, you know why they won't let us go. It's simply business. Are you or is someone you know a marijuana smoker? Have you or is someone in your family been arrested for a marijuana violation? You need to know the truth about pot. Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, is the most comprehensive source of information regarding marijuana and its effects on health as well as legal issues. Normal even offers a database of lawyers specializing in cannabis in your area. Normal, the nation's largest and most successful marijuana law reform organization, has spent decades gathering the knowledge and science on everything related to cannabis. Normal is the best resource to find out the truth about marijuana, connect with a lawyer in your area, or help find an end to prohibition. Information is available at normal.org, that's N-O-R-M-L dot org, or toll free at 888-67-NORMAL. Welcome back, everyone. Toker Talk Radio. Just a minute left here for me to give you some poll numbers. Public policy polling conducted a poll in West Virginia found that 56% of West Virginians support the legalization of medical use of marijuana. A year ago, ago it was 53%, so they've risen three percentage points. We also find in the poll that 51% support removing criminal penalties for possession of small amounts of marijuana, basically decriminalization and only 35% supported keeping prohibition as it is. Legalization is still an uphill battle in West Virginia. 46% surveyed it in West Virginia supported making marijuana legal and regulating it like alcohol. But with 56% support for medical and 46% support for legalization, that's the smallest gap between legalization and medicalization that I've seen in a long time. Also, news from Wyoming. Uh, there are efforts now. Wyoming Normal has dropped a legalization initiative that would allow people 21 and older to have up to four ounces of marijuana unless those people were caregivers, medical caregivers. This is kind of a hybrid bill that would legalize medical as well. Caregivers would be able to have 12 ounces of marijuana. They cannot have felony convictions, of course, and then there's tax limitations on this bill as well, where the sales tax on recreational pot could not exceed 25% of wholesale, and excise taxes would be limited to 15%, so a total of 40% taxation possible under this Wyoming initiative. There's also a legislator in Wyoming who is pushing a medical-only bill for the Wyoming legislature. Well, I've yet to see how well these things will turn out. Wyoming's notoriously conservative, but things are changing all over. That's all the time we got here for Toker Talk Radio. Thanks for joining us. Free Weed with Danny Danko is next here on 420 Radio. Check that out. At 8 p.m., we've got Gordon Green's Music Planet sitting in for Red Eyes. And at 10 o'clock, Electric Bob's Boogaloo. Check it out. Replays of this show between all of those shows. Thanks for joining us for Eden and Brian the Red. I'm Radical Russ, and until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it.